Today, we're looking at the weirdest, the wildest, the most utterly alien family of succulents imaginable. If you haven't guessed what it is, maybe my t-shirt will give you a hint. That's right, today we are looking at the Stapeliads. And not just anything about the Stapeliads, today we're cracking open the Aridzine sealed section to look at the filthy, revolting sex lives of the Stapeliads. So, join me now as we go on a rank, odorous journey into the reproductive habits of these very, very strange plants indeed. But first, what is a Stapeliad? Well, it's a family of plants named after the genus Stapelia, which I guess is probably the most frequently encountered of any of these plants. You're probably familiar with them. They're sometimes called starfish flowers. They kind of look like these trailing cactusy looking succulents that when they bloom, they get these huge, sometimes quite hairy, dark flowers that look, well, unsurprisingly like a starfish. I don't have one to share with you, but I do have a relative. This is Hoodie or Gordonii. You can see it's kind of got that same cactusy kind of form, covered in hard spines. Not in flower at the moment, but it's those flowers that really are what defines this family of plants, makes them so interesting to collectors, makes them so interesting to me, makes them so repulsive to a lot of people. And I'll talk about why that is in just a moment. I do have a whole heap of little seedlings that I intend on repotting. You can see just like this one here. This is a Quaqua. What a fantastic genus name. Uh, and my goal, I don't imagine I'm gonna get them all done in this video, but I do wanna talk about some of these different plants. What makes them interesting? And the thing that makes them interesting is those flowers. So, might start getting them out of pots. I've alluded to what makes those flowers interesting. I won't keep you in the dark any longer. Let's jump in. Now, not a lot of this is gonna make sense if we don't understand anything about plants and their flowers. Flowers, of course, are the reproductive organs of plants. They've got pollen in them. The transferal of that pollen from one flower to another, to oversimplify things, is how plants produce seeds. Often, they need a little bit of help getting pollen from plant A to plant B. And usually that's where things like bees, and in some instances, butterflies and moths and those sorts of things come in. And usually, you'll find that plants' flowers are specifically designed to attract a particular type of pollinator. You can see, for example, night-blooming cacti, which, well, shouldn't come as a surprise that they're pollinated by nocturnal animals like moths or bats, because the flowers open at night time. Not so with our stapeliads. This here is Quaqua mammillaris. I'm going to get it out of its pot and repot it, tell you a little bit about it. Because the thing is, Quaqua mammillaris, if you have a look at the flowers, well, they're pretty different to anything you might have seen before. They are often very deep purple, bordering on black. But the thing I can't convey to you through the screen is how they smell. They stink like rotting meat. And you think to yourself, why on earth would anyone want to have a plant, a flower, that stinks like rotting meat? Well, it's because Quaqua mammillaris and many of its ilk are pollinated by flies. And in fact, that's why I find these plants so cool and wonderful. Now, mercifully, they haven't flowered yet and stunk out the greenhouse, but I can't wait for the day. Look at that. Get those soil off those thick, fleshy roots. Quaqua mammillaris, and indeed many of its relatives. I've got here Hoodia polyphora, which I'm going to be getting out a little bit later on. And Larry Leachia picta. They're all similar. They all absolutely reek to attract those flies, which to me is fantastic because we don't normally think about flowers in that sort of sense. We almost think, oh yeah, bees just do the work for us. That's just what it's all about. Oh my God, what an absolute tangle this is. We think, oh yeah, bees, they'll do all the hard work. When in actual fact, bees are just attracted to flowers because they give them something they want. But when you create a flower that doesn't provide anything for a bee, you've got to incentivize some other animal. That's what these plants do. They don't really give a fly anything 
other than a false sense of hope, giving off that smell, but without giving them anything in return. Look at those roots, absolutely unbelievable. These are gonna be plants that I've no doubt are gonna look heaps bigger when they get a new pot. Now, I've been told fairly reliably that your quarkwas and some of these other plants are pretty finicky on their own roots. They don't do well in cultivation. I don't really care. I'm happy to give it a try anyway. If they die, they die. But the lure of something so epically heavy metal as a spiky cactus looking thing that smells like death, sensational. Can't wait. I'm not going to pot up all of those ones for you on screen. Just know it's going to happen in a moment. Let's have a look at some more because the flowers, they're so varied and wonderful and, well, in my opinion, beautiful, probably without smelling them. Let's see what's next. So this is a pot of Larry Leachia Picta, kind of little globular versions on the Stapeliad theme. Now, give the pot a little bit of a squeeze, loosen up those roots so I can get those plants out. These are also plants that have that same kind of carrion smell about them, smelling like rotting meat. And the flower appearance themselves, which in my opinion is quite delicately beautiful, actually lends itself to that stink. You'll see they're kind of these speckled red colors. And that is in order to approximate the image, I suppose, of dead rotting meat. Something else to attract the flies. Absolutely amazing. Now these have got incredibly small and very delicate roots. I'm just gonna make getting them apart without killing them all quite difficult. Let's see, can we get a few of them up without destroying them? There we go, there's three of them. Let's just see if we can separate them. And away we go. Look at that, wonderful little plants. So. Take our pot, hopefully, with a bit of space, these will start to put on a bit of size. These aren't the only Larry Leachies I've grown from seed, but I've never had them come up quite so thickly before. I can show you uh, another species, Larry Leachia marlofii, which hasn't flowered for me yet, but I'm uh, hoping maybe this growing season I might get lucky. Anyway, look at that. Little baby Larry Leach here, picked her, ready to go, ready to stink the whole house down. Absolutely sensational. Now, I'll get to the rest of those a little bit later. The next one I want to share with you is this pot of Hoodia polyferas, because these have flowers that, in my opinion, are heavy metal in a different way. Can I get them out? Now they stink as well, but rather than having that kind of dead rotting flesh appearance, the flowers are black. How good's that? Now, there we go. Look at that tiny little spiky cactusy looking thing. Now I've got another pot of plants that have got black flowers as well. These are a little bit too small to repot. These are called Tridentea gemiflora. I have no idea why two of these plants have decided to etiolate. Mystery to me, sometimes plants do weird things. The whole pot's just been sitting there in kind of a shady position, you know, adjusting to the light there. And two of them have decided maybe that's not enough. Who knows, plant variability. Tridentia gemiflora and these Hoodia polyferas both have the most awesome and incredible black flowers. The Tridentias, these huge kind of sprawling, again, almost starfish looking things. Whereas the hoodias are almost these strange alien, I don't even know how to describe them, but you know, they're unlike anything else you can find going around the place. And I feel like a broken record saying this, but it's those weird things that personally I find makes growing succulents and cacti so rewarding. These plants are all going into my usual very heavily inorganic 80% mineral soil. They do not 
want to find themselves waterlogged and so I'm going to help them along in that regard. So there's the hoodier ready to go. A few years time might look like it's cousin here. Sensational. Now I don't want to give these plants a bad rep. I don't want you to think that well they all just stink because that's not the case. I'm going to show you a few others that they stand apart from their stinky, revolting, fetid little cousins. The first of these plants that I want to share with you, this is called Monoluma quadrangular. It comes from the Arabian Peninsula, Oman, Yemen, that kind of part of the world. And the first hint that we should have that these plants are not stinkers, just by looking at the color of their flowers, their flowers are yellow, which, well, doesn't look like any kind of rotten, disgusting meat or animal shit that I've ever encountered in my life. No, yellow plants, they're the sorts of things that we see in the garden. They're the sorts of things that do attract our more traditional pollinators. And the flowers on this guy, reputedly, I've never had the chance to smell them, but reputedly, have a far more sweet smell. They smell like honey. What a surprise. Probably because they're pollinated by bees. Now, I suppose, and I'll get these out of their pot in a second, but I suppose to reflect on the duality of some of these families of plants, here's another Quaqua. Man, I love that genus name. This is Quaqua areta. And unlike the Quaqua mammillaris that I shared with you before, Quaqua areta is another yellow flowered plant, and therefore another plant with a more traditional pollination. Smells good. Fantastic. So, you know, just because it's a stapeliad, don't automatically think that it's going to reek out your greenhouse or reek out your balcony or wherever you grow plants. If you like the look of these plants, but you don't think the smell is going to be right, go hunting for plants that don't have flowers, that have those kind of revolting reddy browny blacky kind of patterns you find ones with more traditional flower colors there's a good chance that they're going to be more appropriate to your sensory preferences so to speak all right so we'll pot out pot out one of these monolumas and i'll pot up one of those other quarkwas and then i'll share a couple of other interesting things with you Now the thing is, these plants, they all do like really quite strong sunlight, but because they've been growing in a partially shaded position, kind of very bright indirect sunlight, just while they get used to coming out from my propagation hot box out into the real world, I'm gonna put them back there. I like to only change one thing at a time. In this case, I'm changing their pots. I don't want to change their pots and also change the aspect just asking for trouble all right so that's the monoluma now we'll do the qua qua these plants their roots are so thick and fleshy and yet so easily damaged but getting them apart is a fairly delicate affair but there you go you can see they have fairly minimalistic roots as you can see which is why damaging them is you know not a great idea because not all of these plants regenerate their roots too well i'm not entirely sure which species grow well from cutting and which are a bit resistant to it but you know care is always the best especially when we're dealing with plants with a bit of uncertainty around them and so there we go, Quaqua areta. Now, I'm gonna share with you one more plant that, well, doesn't need repotting, but I feel like it would be almost neglectful for me not to mention the flowering of this amazing stapeliad. Looks very different, different kind of group of plants as well. Let's have a look. This vining, twisting monstrosity here, this is a species of Serapegia. Now, you may well have heard of Serapegia before. There's a common houseplant, Serapegia linearis, which is often sold as chain of hearts. This, on the other hand, is Serapegia ampliata, and it's got a nickname. 
the condom plant. And for good reason, if you see a picture of its flowers, unfortunately this one isn't yet in flower for the year. Now, the way the flowers work, it's not attracting flies through stench. They must have a bit of a smell because they do attract flies. However, the flowers themselves act almost like a trap because inside are a whole series of little hairs and those hairs point down. So the fly goes in through this opening at the top of the flower and the hairs all pointing downwards. The fly goes past the hairs, can't go back out. It's trapped in there, struggles around for a bit, gets absolutely bathed in pollen. After a couple of days, flower kind of withers away. Fly is released. Unsurprisingly, it wants to get out of there. But as well, you know, flies, not the most intelligent animals. Off they go, straight into the next Serapegia flower. Bang, trapped again, and they deposit all that pollen all over the other plant. And thus, we get little baby Seri, Sera, bleh, bleh, Serapegia ampliatas. What a fantastic adaptation. And it's so obscure, trapping flies to ensure the next of your species comes along. Sensational. So, that is the absolutely fascinating and really quite surprising and often revolting world, the sex of the Stapeliads. I've got a whole heap of plants here now that need potting up, so that's what I'm going to focus on. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've had a bit of fun. Maybe you'll go out and get some fetid, rank, disgusting smelling plants for yourself. There's heaps more that I didn't touch on, like the Pseudolithos, like uh, Brachystelma. Look them up if you're keen. For now, I'm gonna pop these plants up. I hope you learned something. I hope you had a lot of fun. I'll catch you next time. Happy growing.